Good morning and good afternoon. On behalf of IUFRO and the coordinators of Working Parties 7.03.05 and 7.03.16, I would like to welcome you to this webinar in our webinar series on the behavioral and chemical ecology of bark and wood boring insects. For those of you who are new to IUFRO, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, this is a global, non-profit, non-governmental science organization. This global, global organization includes approximately 15,000 members from 120 countries and 600 member organizations. IUFRO is made up of several divisions, and the working parties responsible for this webinar series reside within Division 7, Forest Health. The coordinator of Division 7 is Eki Brockerhoff. And within the division, there are two research groups, pathology coordinated by Todd Ramsfield and entomology coordinated by Marta Klepwick. These research groups are made up of working parties and the working parties that host this webinar series as mentioned are 7.03.05, the ecology and management of bark and wood boring insects and 7.03.16, behavioral and chemical ecology of forest insects. The mission of IUFRO is essentially the same as that of these working parties in this webinar series, to advance research excellence and knowledge sharing and foster science-based solutions to forest-related challenges. One of the many things the current pandemic has made clear to me is that our most meaningful resource is our networks. <clears throat> For those of you who would like to learn more about IUFRO and how to become involved in this powerful research network, I encourage you to consider one or more of the options listed here. Before we get started, a little housekeeping. Josephine Kefalek, a senior PhD student at the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnology Institute at the University of Pretoria, will moderate this question period. For those of you who would like to ask a question, you can do it one of two ways. You can either use the raise hand feature in the chat box in which case at the appropriate time, Josephine will unmute your microphone and allow you to ask your question directly of the speaker. Alternatively, you can type the question into the chat box and post it for everyone to see and at the appropriate time, Josephine will ask your question for you. To make Josephine's job a little easier, I ask that you only post questions to everyone in the chat box. And if you have personal communication you'd like to do, please do that privately. I also remind you that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted after on the Working Party YouTube channel listed here. Before we get started, special thanks need to go out to a lot of people, most notably to Quentin Wignard, who is a senior PhD student also at the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnology Institute at the University of Pretoria, who manages the IT side of the webinar series, and as mentioned previously, Josephine Kefalek, who will moderate the webinar series and to the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnology Institute at the University of Pretoria, or FABI, as many of you likely know it, for providing the platform from which we provide the webinar series. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's symposium coordinator, Dr. Barbara Bentz. Dr. Bentz is a project leader with the USDA Forest Service, where she has an active research program that covers the biology, ecology, and management of bark beetles. Her current research emphasizes understanding bark beetle population dynamics in a changing climate and the role of bark beetles in post-fire environments. Dr. Bentz is an IUFRO office holder serving as deputy coordinator of the entomology research group in division seven. The webinar she has coordinated today involves a series of talks on climate change effects on bark beetle range expansion, community associates and outbreak dynamics. Hello everyone and a big thanks to the officers of the two IUFRO working parties that invited us to join this webinar series and also to Jeremy and the Fabi team for helping it to run smoothly. So today we're going to be talking about bark beetles and climate change. I'm going to give a short introduction to the subject and a little update of some research on this topic from my lab and then three of our esteemed colleagues are going to present on different aspects of how climate change may be influencing bark beetle community dynamics and range expansion. So it's painfully obvious that warming is occurring globally relative to temperatures even a half a century ago, and that higher latitudes are warming more rapidly than other locations. In addition to warming temperatures, 
precipitation trends are also changing, with parts of the Western US and Europe experiencing significant decreases in precipitation. It's also obvious that bark beetles are responding to these changing climates in multiple ways. This is a snapshot of some recent publications from North America and Europe focused on how drought is influencing bark beetles through effects to host trees, often in combination with direct effects of warming temperatures. And these are a few recent publications highlighting um, bark beetle migration trends in North America and Europe. For those species that have been historically limited by climate rather than host trees, migration into new areas is occurring as new habitats become thermally suitable. And a majority of this migration is occurring northward. A prime example of a species that is migrating north is Dendroctinus ponderosi, the mountain pine beetle. This species has an extensive range in Western North America, but host trees are found both to the north and south of the current distribution. Alan's gonna give us an update on mountain pine beetle range expansion in Canada in his presentation today. But right now, um, I'd like to talk about what we were interested in looking at was the potential for population persistence in place as temperatures warm. To evaluate this, we conducted a reciprocal translocation experiment. We reciprocally translocated two mountain pine beetle populations, one from the core of the range in Northern Utah and a population at the Southern range edge in Arizona, which is at a relatively high elevation. And both of these are in the United States. Each population was manually infested into bolts, which were then placed at their source site and also at the novel site. In addition to the reciprocal translocation, we also placed each population at a warmer, low elevation site in Arizona where mountain pine beetle has not historically been found. Infested bolts were placed at each site in late July and early August, which is when attacks typically occur. And then they were left there until um, emergence the following year. So before looking at the results from this experiment, I'd like to introduce you to our two populations. So we've shown repeatedly in common garden experiments that total development time at constant temperatures is significantly longer for mountain pine beetle populations at the southern range extent, including Arizona, shown here in red, relative to the more northern mountain pine beetle populations in Utah, Utah and Idaho, shown here in blue. So this indicates there's genetic differences between the two populations, but it's, it's been unclear the life stage or the trait that was responsible for these differences. To evaluate this, we compared data for each population from phloem sandwich experiments. So it's clear you can see that the Arizona development rates of these um, life stages were either quite similar or actually faster than Utah individuals in multiple life stages. You can see the Arizona's in the red here with a faster development rate. This indicates that these life stages can't be responsible for these large differences in generation time. We would have expected one of these life stages to be actually slower in the um, Arizona population. And it instead points to the tenoral adult or the pre-emergent stage as the life stage with the developmental differences between the two populations. Some recent experiments with x-rays um, also support these differences. We also investigated this thermal threshold that occurs in both populations during the last and final life stage prior to pupation called the prepupal stage. Although historically thought to be a simple threshold for pupation, we recently found a facultative prepupal diapause in both populations. It's induced by temperatures in this range 15 to, 70, 15 to 17 degrees C. And this diapause state is highly variable both within and between the populations. So with this knowledge, let's return to the reciprocal translocation experiment results. As expected based on our previous research, the Arizona population took longer than the Utah population for total development and emergence from bolts at all three sites, Utah site and then the two Arizona sites. This again highlights local adaptation and genetic effects between the two populations. I don't have time to show the results, but we also found genetic differences and local adaptation in cold hardening capacity in the two populations. 
So shown here are samples taken at each of the sites, reflecting the life stages present during the fall, winter, and spring, and they were mostly third and fourth instars. At the warm Arizona site, um, Arizona low, both populations overwintered as fourth instars, likely in a pre-pupil diapause. And then by the spring, um, sample the majority of individuals at all the sites were fourth instars. Average temperature at the Arizona low or warmest site was on average about five and a half degrees C warmer than the Northern Utah site. Despite this, all individuals at all sites developed on a univoltine life cycle, as you can see here. Generation time took from about 350 days to almost 400, depending on the population and location. So despite being more than five degrees warmer on average, all sites had winter temperatures below the thresholds um, for pre-pupil diapause um, induction, which likely kept individuals even at the warmest site on a univoltine life cycle. We also found that the greatest reproductive success of the two populations occurred at that warm Arizona low site, suggesting population persistence in the warm climate of that site. These results, however, um, also tell us that looking at average temperatures is not informative when it comes to predicting bark beetle response. Five degrees C warmer is a lot, and it's actually more than what is predicted using some uh, global climate models. Instead, it's important to include the effect of year-round temperatures. In the case of mountain pine beetle, as long as fall winter temperatures are below 15 to 17 degrees and the pre-pupil diapause is invoked, univoltinism and population persistence will likely prevail. One final note, in addition to placing the bolts at the three field sites, both populations were reared at a constant 18 and 25 in the, in the lab. Total generation time for the Utah population was less at 25 compared to 18, but there was no difference between those two temperatures in the Arizona population. This is suggested delay in, in the life stage after the fourth end star where overwintering occurred. It also suggests that the delay occurs at warm temperatures. This is further highlighted in the field data where the Arizona population here, generation time was not reduced at that warm Arizona low site, whereas at the, the Utah population it was. So this again points to the general adult stage as we found only slight differences in pupil development rates between the two populations. So we're currently investigating a diapause in adult mountain pine beetle that manifests in the Arizona population and is induced by warm temperatures. This is not unusual in beetles in general, but it hasn't, it hasn't been identified within scolotines to my knowledge. How does this influence response to climate change? Diapause evolves to synchronize individuals with each other and with the, the seasons. A mismatch could disrupt re the required synchrony. In addition, a combination of a pre-pupil and adult diapause could limit the capacity for mountain pine beetle populations to develop on less than a univoltine life, spike, life cycle, especially if the adult diapause is not facultative. We see similar outcomes for Dendroctinus rufipennis, the this, this spruce beetle, which also diapauses in the same two life stages. In fact, we see these same two diapause states in multiple scolotine species. Diapause, especially facultative diapause, is really, really tricky to identify. And my guess is the more that we look, the more that we'll find. So in conclusion, my intent was to highlight the complexities and nonlinearities in predicting bark beetle response to changing thermal regimes. The two mountain pine beetle populations that we studied appear to have sufficient plasticity to persist in a warming climate, given that the warming is seasonally appropriate. We can't predict bark beetle response based on average temperatures alone. And uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators and I look forward to the next three presentations and hearing about aspects of bark beetle community dynamics and climate change. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today.
Uh, I'm going to present to you some of the results uh, derived from the work of Stan Picorni, one of my PhD candidates, uh, looking into the potential for mountain pine beetle populations to persist uh, in the sub-outbreak or endemic state east of the Rocky Mountains in novel pine habitats. So to accomplish this, we'll begin first by uh, looking at the status of the outbreak, uh, as well as the control efforts that have been made to date to slow the spread towards the western boreal forest on the part of uh, uh, government agencies. Uh, we'll talk about what will be the inevitable collapse, and I'll outline what I mean by this shortly. Uh, and then we'll uh, spend a bit of time asking the question about persistence versus extinction, uh, which are the two potential outcomes of epidemic collapse. I'll outline the population state dependent niches for us to understand this uh, particular dichotomy. And then we'll ask the question itself as to whether or not to endemic mountain pine beetle populations can persist in these novel habitats. Um, to get at this question, there are a series of studies I'll pull from. Um, we'll actually just look at some of the uh, uh, highlights of the results looking into the uh, endemic niche in native and novel habitats. Um, we'll look at it from the point of view of bottom-up interactions uh, insofar as the availability of suitable trees is concerned, uh, as well as top-down interactions from the point of view of subcortical competitors and predators in the different forest types uh, before we wrap things up. Okay, so the mountain pine beetle uh, escaped across uh, the uh, northern Rocky Mountains uh, and spread across the uh, Alberta Plateau towards the western boreal forest uh, um, about 15 years ago or so, around 2006. Uh, the net displacement uh, of that original invasion event, uh, as well as the continued spread, has placed the beetle uh, right on the doorstep of the western boreal forest, approximately 400 kilometers or more uh, east of his historic leading edge. Epidemic populations are now established not only in the naive lodgepole pine habitats that exist east of the Rocky Mountains, but also all the way out into the jack pine and, of course, the jack pine and lodgepole pine hybrids that sit in between. There's been a significant effort on the part of uh, government agencies to slow the spread since about 2006. And indeed, if we look at projections of the rate of spread in the absence of control versus control, things have been quite effective from the point of view of slowing the spread. So the government of Alberta implemented a slow the spread strategy uh, in 2006, which entailed um, identifying and destroying all infestations of three or more trees within a uh, defined leading edge of the infestation, and then working backwards towards the west. Um, this effort has protected roughly 200,000 hectares from epidemic infestation to date based upon some projections we've done uh, with my group in the lab. But as you can see from this, uh, spread is expected to continue despite the efforts at slowing the spread. And so then this brings us to the question about when is that population uh, in the epidemic state going to collapse? And this is simply a question that is derived from evidence that we've got from past outbreaks that typically collapse long before they've completed all of their uh, potential host material. So under the slow the spread strategy, um, you can see here that the area colonized is projected to stop increasing before 2025. And again, these are based upon projections that we've done given uh, a spread model we've created. Uh, we've even uh, considered whether or not this would be true if we were uh, not applying the same level of control, and indeed if that control level had diminished as a consequence of diminishing investments. And yes, indeed, we can see that if it's 70% of the effort to date, uh, or even 35% of the effort to date, there is, uh, there is an endpoint. Populations will slow um, and stop their spread. Uh, this is a really a, a consequence of the fact that there is declining areas that are eligible for colonization. And you can see that here. So essentially what this means is that spread itself is a function of population size and habitat quality as defined in our model. And then as populations decline, either through uh, efforts at control or just ultimately from host depletion, so does the probability of successful colonization of unoccupied areas. Uh, and just to say this is um, in keeping with observations, of course, we know that with the current hyperepidemic that has affected so much of British Columbia, despite the original projections for the loss of um, over 80% of the mature pine within British Columbia, uh, the populations have collapsed, uh, le um, leaving 50% uh, untouched. So essentially, uh, beetles can eat themselves out of house and home before they have the capacity to spread off to new areas. So what follows epidemic collapse? Well, in its native range, uh, populations persist between outbreaks in the endemic or sub-outbreak state. And you can see these endemic periods highlighted here uh, in amongst the outbreak periods uh, throughout Western Canada. 
Um, outbreaks, of course, occur as local endemic populations transition to the epidemic state. What's most important from this, though, is that the endemic niche is not the same as the epidemic niche. Epidemic populations, as we know, preferentially colonize highly defensive trees using pheromone-mediated mass attacks. But by contrast, endemic populations will preferentially colonize defensively impaired trees that are almost always uh, colonized by other bark beetle species, usually before or concurrently. Uh, the switch between these two behaviors actually is driven by a state-dependent maternal effect, uh, which some of the work that Jordan Burke did some years ago has shown. The endemic niche is really characterized by populations that are very small, much less than about 300 females per hectare, which is about the threshold at which the behaviors begin to change. The niche itself uh, comprises trees that are smaller than stand average, in other words, they're suppressed through competition, uh, or they've been damaged by uh, some biotic or abiotic agent, and, as I said before, they're previously or concurrently colonized by other bark beetles, uh, usually with those of, uh, that we refer to as uh, secondary beetles that are non-aggressive in nature. And you can see that based upon these data here. Uh, typically, when small populations of mountain pine beetle do occur, they do so in uh, conjunction with uh, secondary bark beetle populations. Now, if you look at these things in the woods, what you would find is something like this, where you would have a mountain pine beetle gallery uh, by itself, usually uh, amongst a whole series of other galleries uh, created by these secondary beetles. In this particular case, we're looking at Pseudips mexicanus uh, that has uh, occupied this tree uh, concurrently with mountain pine beetle, and indeed uh, there was evidence, I'm sure, in this tree of earlier attacks on the part of Pseudips mexicanus as well. And ultimately, a tree such as this would be a small one in the forest, uh, usually uh, a suppressed, uh, hard to find and quite rare in its distribution. So this then leads us to two questions. One is proximate, and that is uh, whether or not there is a viable endemic niche within, within evolutionarily naive lodgepole jack and hybrid habitats. And of course, our ultimate question then is whether or not these sub-outbreak uh, populations are able to persist following outbreak collapse in these novel pine forests. Um, the study itself uh, involved a, a rather extensive and long-term uh, investigation. Um, we established a transect of roughly 800 kilometers ranging from the native range of uh, the mountain pine beetle up into the boreal jack pine. Eight locations and 16 stands, all of which were uh, unaffected by epidemic mountain pine beetles. And all of them were considered to be highly suitable for mountain pine beetle in the sense that uh, they comprised uh, fairly large and contiguous areas, uh, all pine uh, and all old. And as you can see here, originally we chose co-evolved lodgepole pine habitats, naive habitats, hybrids, and jack pine based upon their expected level of introgression. Interestingly though, based upon a retrospective analysis of the level of introgression, we found that our hybrid stands were actually mostly jack pine. And so we reclassified things just to represent the fact that we had three forest types, co-evolved lodgepole, naive lodgepole, and jack. And these acronyms alongside each will persist as I show you the results as we go forward. We surveyed all of the stems in each stand to identify endemic susceptible trees. And endemic susceptible trees were defined as those that were recently attacked or currently occupied by secondary bark, by bark beetles, but with detectable amounts of healthy, unutilized phloem. Uh, the co-evolved lodgepole pine habitats were surveyed before the hyperepidemic, so in 2001 and 2003 by myself. Uh, the novel habitats, lodgepole and jack pine, were surveyed in 2014 and 2016 by myself and Stan Picorni. Uh, we took a subsample of all trees and brought them back to the lab for detailed assessments. Okay. Looking at some of the results just from the point of view of stand conditions, there are significant structural differences in susceptible stands among habitat types. Effectively, the co-evolved and naive lodgepole pine habitats tend to be two to three times more dense than jack pine habitats. This intertree competition, as measured by a stand density index, was similar in both uh, lodgepole habitats uh, and two times greater than that associated with jack pine. Uh, this extends itself into defining the availability of endemic susceptible trees. So essentially, co-evolved and naive lodgepole pine habitats had three times more endemic susceptible trees when compared with western jack pine forests. The endemic susceptible jack pine trees also had higher growth rates uh, than similar trees in lodgepole pine habitats, but equivalent uh, phloem thicknesses. So these fewer and more vigorous susceptible trees in jack pine will limit the endemic mountain pine beetle densities. 
In terms of the uh, competitors uh, and those that co-occur with mountain pine beetle, we found that there were distinct secondary bark beetle assemblages in each forest type. So within the co-evolved forest, we found that the assemblage was dominated by Pseudobus mexicanus and Orthotomicus latidens. Whereas in the lodgepole pine forest uh, east of the Rockies, we found uh, mostly Dendroctus murriani and uh, Orthotomicus latidens. Uh, but by contrast, jack pine was really dominated by Dendroctus valens and uh, Apes pinei. There is evidence for facilitatory interactions between, uh, say, Pseudo mexicanus and the endemic mountain pine beetle in the co-evolved lodgepole pine habitats, and we're unsure if um, its absence is uh, going to affect the viability of the epidemic niche or the endemic niche, pardon me, in mountain pine beetle uh, populations east of the Rockies. In terms of additional subcortical uh, competitors and predators, we did find that colonization of endemic susceptible trees by wood borers was something that was rare in uh, the co-evolved habitats, but quite common, especially in jack pine east of the Rocky Mountains. And so we discovered both tetropian and monocamus species concurrently with bark beetles, which was a very strange thing to see uh, east of the Rockies and, uh, as I said, particularly in jack pine. Nearly half of all susceptible trees in jack pine were colonized by wood borers. And remember, wood borers are facultative intraguild predators and competitors, which may further limit the niche for mountain pine beetle in the endemic state uh, east of the Rockies in jack pine. Um, the impacts of having wood borers present was actually quite extensive in the sense that when they were there, uh, they typically consumed almost as uh, much as 20 times the amount of phloem as compared to just bark beetles alone in these endemic susceptible trees. So this exploitation competition by wood borers may limit uh, phloem availability to endemic mountain pine beetle, especially in these jack pine habitats. The presence of wood borers goes further than that in terms of its impacts. We found that uh, woodpecker predation tends to increase uh, within these habitats on these infested trees with tree size. But woodpecker foraging on endemic susceptible trees was much more likely when wood borers were present, especially in jack pine. And thus the niche for mountain pine beetle may be further constrained in jack pine due to this spillover predation from woodpeckers that are actually there preying on the wood borers. So in conclusion then, uh, we can say that western boreal jack pine forests are unsuitable for endemic mountain pine beetle due to lower niche availability and suitability, both as a consequence of bottom-up and top-down constraints. Uh, following epidemic collapse, the invasion front will very likely retreat as mountain pine beetle populations go locally extinct. And so populations would retreat back to the naive lodgepole uh, to the uh, uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. Lodgepole pine forests uh, are highly suitable for persistent endemic mountain pine beetle populations, particularly those naive lodgepole pine forests east of the Rockies. And they are likely to facilitate future outbreaks. And remember, we know that these naive lodgepole uh, actually are highly suitable to mountain pine beetle uh, given their lower defensive capacities. In the long term, the western boreal jack pine forests remain at high risk, though, of invasion by future epidemic populations, which will likely arise from the adjacent lodgepole pine forests. And so thank you very much uh, for your attention, and what I'll do is simply acknowledge my funding, uh, FRI Research, uh, NSERC, and Natural Resources Canada through their Mountain Pine Beetle Initiative. And thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Jeff Garnis. I'm an associate professor at the University of New Hampshire, and today I'm going to talk about a project comparing communities of the not-so-southern pine beetle between its historic and advancing northern range. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Caroline Kanaski, uh, currently a PhD student in my lab. This was basically her master's project, so a huge amount of work went in from her there. Fred Steven contributed uh, an enormous amount of data as well, and Kevin Dodds was integral to the project, uh, as was funding from the Forest Service. Uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers of this webinar and Barbara Benz for inviting me to speak. So probably don't need to work too hard to convince this group that global climate change has impacts on communities and ecosystems. This can be via a whole suite of mechanisms, including altered phenology, changing disturbance regimes, elevated extinction risk, and ultimately uh, geographic range shifts or biodiversity redistribution. This is where I'm going to focus my talk today. So what are the consequences of shifting geographic ranges for communities and ecosystems? Well, in a forest insect or forest health world, we might be thinking about uh, contact with naive hosts as ranges shift, changes in popula population dynamics or, or outbreak potential or changes in aggressiveness of insects or pathogens, altered interaction webs or trophic structure, 
and ultimately impacts on landscapes or ecosystems in the most dramatic examples, uh, regime shifts. So one dramatic example is the mountain pine beetle, which surely people know about, uh, Dendroctinus ponderosi, which uh, for a whole host of reasons, but uh, definitely including warmer winters, was, cap was able to move upslope and north and east and uh, break out of its historic range boundary and, and spill over into the eastern slopes and into the plains here uh, and resulting in really dramatic um, lodgepole pine mortality and now contacting the hybrid zone and the, and the jack pine forest. Um, ultimately, hundreds of millions of trees killed, really dramatic effects on landscapes. Um, so that's sort of, um, that's one, one example. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be talking about the southern pine beetle, Dendroctinus frontalis, or southern pine beetle, SPB. This is a native forest insect, and it's the most important pine feeding insect in eastern North America. This is largely because it mass attack, attacks and kills uh, healthy pine, and is a major driver of succession, and is a key keystone species in a complex forest community. It's also an economic pest, uh, causing major lo timber losses in pine growing regions of the southern United States. This is what mass attack looks like. Many, many beetles chewing into the phloem, trees pitching, uh, producing copious oleoresin, trying to pitch the beetles out. Uh, beetles swimming upstream in this oozing uh, resin. Uh, ultimately, if enough beetles reach the phloem, um, they're able to kill the tree and tap out the, the defense and um, have a nice, happy resource for their eggs and larvae. Uh, and also make that resource available to a whole suite of other organisms, which is the subject of today's talk. So uh, there's been a lot of nice modeling work out of the Ares lab at uh, Dartmouth College, but um, Southern Pine Beetle is moving north with warming winters is the upshot. Uh, and the basic reason, and that's what this graph here on the left says, is that beetle killing freeze events are less frequent at the former range edge than they used to be, uh, which allows, which predicts northward uh, movement of of uh, range boundaries. And that's exactly what we see. So in 2014, populations of the Southern Pine Beetle uh, were established populations or outbreaking populations were discovered in Long Island, this island right here, um, 80 kilometers north of the historic range boundary of this beetle. And subsequent trapping has detected beetles as far north as Albany and all over Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and you know, onto the Cape uh, Cape Cod, um, no, no established populations or dead trees have been found, but, but uh, I suspect it's only a matter of time. So the particular tree species or habitat that, that southern pine beetle is colonizing in this part of the range currently is uh, pitch pine. So this is Pinus rigida. It's a unique tree. It's um, not economically important in any way, but um, it's a unique e ecosystem and it's home to globally and locally rare species. There's some endemism in these in these habitats. It's a dry adapted, fire adapted ecosystem uh, with a mixed pine and oak overstory. Uh, patchily distributed in the landscape, uh, the matrix of pine being white pine, which is a less susceptible pine species, uh, but still an important and unique habitat that we want to preserve and protect. So here's Caroline hugging a pitch pine tree. And our motivating questions for this work were, how do Southern Pine Beetle associated bark communities differ in the expanding versus the historical range? And then how might cha changes in the incidence, abundance, or behavior of key interacting species or yields influence Southern Pine Beetle dynamics in the northern parts of the range? Southern Pine Beetle has a diverse and well-characterized community of associates. Uh, probably well, as well characterized as it is because of the economic support, importance of this insect, but there are well over 100 species that have been identified in association with the southern pine beetle, including a suite of other bark beetles, its bark beetles and other dendroctinus, as well as others, um, predators, parasitoids, um, other phloem feeders, um, mites and fungi, of course, although I'm, I'm not gonna be speaking about the, those groups here today. Uh, but really a diverse ecosystem present in um, beetle killed trees. So in order to make a comparison between North and South, we need data. Um, thankfully, we had access to data. In fact, a long-term data set of community associates in 
Southern pine beetle spots uh, and SBB killed trees. 22 years, in fact, of southern pine beetle research in the uh, in this part of the range, in the core of the range of the southern pine beetle and the, and the southern pine forest, uh, was preserved and captured in an access database and made available to us by Fred Stevens. Stephen, and we're very grateful for that fact. Uh, we also collected data in Long Island and attempted to in Pennsylvania, although we didn't actually find active spots there. Um, and we're able to make some interesting comparisons with the Southern database. Here's what the data sheets look like. This one was, this data sheet is from 1976, you can see by the code. And at that stage, we were, we were uh, punching, um, using punch cards and line input from a terminal to get data into the system. So I'm, I'm grateful for the amount of work that, that went into this, including on the data curation side. So we made it our best effort to um, sample in a way that was comparable with the Southern database. Uh, largely, this was bark sampling like this, removing larger pieces of bark of known size or standard size, and ultimately collecting and emerging insects from within it. We also did an emergence study where we use these emergence traps to collect um, uh, insects that were present in the galleries of the southern pine beetle and emerging through the bark directly on the tree. And we used, um, we followed the felling teams that were managing for southern pine beetle to sample across the height of the bowl from the bottom to the top. Um, we didn't actually climb trees, so where we did sample standing trees, it was typically only a meter, meter or two above the ground. So here's Caroline um, with a whole suite of her emergence containers where she broke pieces of bark and put them in here, checked them weekly or uh, every maybe twice a week, identified all the insects coming out to genus, species, or family as appropriate. Um, massive amount of work, as you can imagine, uh, but some really nice masters came out of it. So uh, we also have some additional data from a log emergence study from Jess Kinsley area in that, uh, at the New York DEC. Okay, so results. I'm gonna show the first suite of graphs is rank abundance curves, and they're a useful way to depict these kinds of data. So here we have the most abundant species on a log scale on the, on the left side of the graph, and decreasing abundance in rank order from left to right, uh, with the most rare species, or rare, rare species coming out here. And so th these were ordered based on the combined abundance in north and south. North is, uh, is on the top and south is in red on the bottom here. There are sort of mirror images of one another. So that's why there are some taxa that are missing uh, that, were, that were abundant because they were abundant in the database globally, but not in the northern sample, specifically in the southern sample. So this is a log linear decline in abundance. This is uh, commonly seen in community studies. Um, which suggests this is a relatively standard community, as one, one would expect. Uh, species richness in the northern site was 67. Uh, we, we detected 67 species, uh, 65 in the south, and the pooled richness was 82 species. So most most species actually occurred both the north and south, or, or most taxa, I should say. A lot of these were identified as species, but not all of them. Some of these represent families or even orders in some case. So here are the here are the the yellow bars are the taxa that are missing that are present in one part of the range in the southern range in this case and, the, and absent from the north or present in the north and absent in the south here, uh, which just gives you a, a look at how that how um, presence or unique taxa were distributed. Fifteen present in the north or sort of absent in the north that were present in the south versus seventeen absent in the south that were present in the north. So similar numbers there. Um, here we could break it down by guild. Uh, here we're looking just at southern pine beetle. Uh, the focal guild is highlighted in bright blue, and any missing taxa are yellow. So the southern pine beetle, obviously the most abundant species since it was the focal species of the study. Not a surprise there, also it's an abundant species. F foam feeders um, like Casonus cronatus, many people probably know of, Sodis nemerensis, or Various longhorn or jewel beetles were um, present in both the north and south and distributed across the abundance, the abundance rank hierarchy um, fairly randomly, a few cases of absence in one of the other places. Um, similar story for predators, diverse predator taxa. Uh, some of the most abundant predators were actually absent in the north, uh, but 
Thanasmus dubius, which is by far the most important predator of southern pine beetle, and Metatera pestreata, this um, predatory fly, were present in both places. Diverse suite of parasitoids, all hymenopteran parasitoids uh, across 10 families, also distributed across the rank abundance curve and only absent uh, in one or the other place in sort of, sort of spotty distribution. Uh, bark beetles, we, we uh, in the southern database, or let's say the let's say the global database, but both north and south, where we, we had Ips ipsovulsus, Ips grandicolis, Ips calligraphus, Dendroctinus terebrans, and Hylastes porculus, uh, along a handful of others that were really quite quite rare. Um, Ips ipsovulsus was absent from the northern sites, which is quite interesting. I think it's, uh, it seems that it's actually absent based on distribution records. It's present as far north as Pennsylvania, but it's never been recorded in New York as far as I was able to find. Maybe other people know otherwise. Interestingly, Dendroctinus terebrans, which, which is a southern species or a southerly distributed species, is absent in the southern database, but I suspect that it's actually present. They just didn't collect it for whatever reason. Um, and then some of the ambrosia beetles, um, similar story. Not, not too abundant, mostly present in both places. So overall, this is a story that um, of high community similarity. So we see some divergence between north and south, south and left, north and the right, on uh, these Venn di diagrams. But overall, there's there's a vast um, overlap in um, in the communities that we're detecting in, across this pretty major uh, latitudinal gradient. Richness is also quite similar. So uh, here we have species accumulation curves in pitch pine. We anticipate estimated diversity at Michal one estimator suggests 67.2 species at the asymptote here. Really not that different from Loblolly estimate at 71 species and only slightly higher than the short leaf estimate at 54 species. So richness similar. If we look at it by site, similar story, more variable of course. If we look at um, com community composition using NMDS plots, uh, there is actually divergence in composition between north and south. So this is the southern grouping and the northern grouping, we can break it up further into loblolly and shortleaf, diverge slightly in the south, and the different trap types actually diverge in terms of their community composition in the north, as you can see here, uh, which is something we need to keep in mind. Abundance uh, of southern pine beetle. Uh, variable, but pitch pine falls right in the middle here, so no no strong species or region effects. Um, Ips, again, Ipsivulsis was absent in the north, whereas it's the most abundant species in the south. Ips calligraphus and grandicolis were very rare in the, in the north, somewhat less rare in the south, but this is based on a much larger data set, so pretty rare. Thanasmus dubius, the checker spot beetle predator, um, also quite um, variable and no pattern with respect to region or, or site, or, or pine species, sorry. Uh, same story with parasitoids, pitch pine falling right in the middle there. I'll skip this. Let's. This was only from the northern sites because they didn't collect data on cerebicids, but present and variable across the northern sites, as was blue stain as we would expect. Uh, the last thing I'll mention here is that um, southern pine beetle seems to occupy a greater proportion of the bowl in the northern sites. So here we have total tree height uh, on the X, length of infestation on the Y. One would expect uh, 100, using 100% of the bowl would cause points to fall on this one-to-one -one line. You can see the northern sites are falling closer to the one-to-one -one line than the southern sites. Um, why that is exactly we don't know. It, it's tempting to, to hypothesize that the absence of if, ipsivulsis in the north, which tends to colonize the higher parts of the bowl, might be opening uh, a, a niche for southern pine beetle to be able to colonize higher up the tree. Whether that's exactly true or not, we really don't know. So just to finish, southern pine beetle associated communities are remarkably similar in the expanding range. There have been, there's been a loss of some species like Ipsivulsis that could be important, but overall the story is one of similarity, not difference, I'd say. Uh, but the differences in abundance or the strength and nature of interactions uh, could become increasingly key as the Northern March uh, continues. So thanks very much. And sorry, I 
about 40 seconds from your time here, but uh, hopefully uh, there'll be questions and time for them. So your contact information, and uh, thanks again. Oh, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. My name is Rich Hofstetter. I'm going to talk about how climate change is going to influence the ectosymbiotic community associated with bark beetles. I'm also throwing in ambrosia beetles here as well, because I think that these interactions are quite similar, and the effects of ectosymbionts on beetles are going to be like that of bark beetles as well. Co-authors on this talk include Sneha Visa, who's a PhD student in my lab, Kier Klepsik with the Jones Center, and Katrina Villari with the University of Georgia. Bark beetles introduce a variety of species into the tree. These are called ectosymbionts in that they are free living within the host phloem and xylem and transport on the beetle to and from tree resources. These organisms are specially adapted to attach to the surface of beetles or in special mechangia or structures which house and promote these particular species. There's a variety of species that include mites, nematodes, bacteria, viruses, and yeast. The beetle has a positive influence on all of these organisms as a mode of transportation to and from host trees. The effects on these symbionts on the beetle can be quite diverse. Uh, sometimes they're negative, where they might be pathogenic, antagonistic, or predatory on the beetle, or positive in the sense of a nutrient symbiont, or mutualist rather, uh, or reduced tree metabolites, for instance, allowing beetle larvae to develop and perform within a healthy tree, for instance. In any case, they're diverse, uh, multiple types, and they're going to uh, influence population dynamics of the beetle and host beetle interactions. These species also interact with each other. Let's take mites for example. In this case we have uh, mites that may prefer a particular fungi. They carry these spores, they introduce and spread the spores uh, throughout the phloem. They may actually increase the diversity of these particular fungal species within the tree. This is different from a beetle which may to introduce only a strain of a fungus while the mites are producing and, and spreading uh, multiple uh, spores of these fungus. These fungi might be benefit or, benefit or mutualist of the, the beetle, uh, and so these mites are going to have a pretty strong effect and influence on the performance of the beetle in this case. The video here shows mites that are predators of bark beetle eggs, and these are two different species. Uh, that are commonly found with its typographis. The condition within the tree is going to significantly impact the performance and diversity of these ectosymbionts. So tree chemistry, for instance secondary metabolites, are going to promote or decline uh, certain species. Nutrients such as nitrogen, sugar, is also going to be important. Temperature within the tree, uh, throughout the life cycle of the beetle is going to influence all of these ectosymbiotic community members and also interactions amongst each other. Let's take Dendroxinus frontalis as an example of this complexity of interactions. So on the top you see uh, three different fungi. Two of them are mutualistic fungi of the southern pine beetle and one is an antagonistic called Ophiopsis minus. And the blue, green, and orange columns in the figure show a range of temperatures that these fungi experience within the tree. And this was a controlled experiment where logs of the tree was placed in these different temperature regimes. And what we find is that the fungi perform differently as a result of these temperatures. For instance, Entomocratissium performs very poorly in warm temperature and very well in cool temperature. This is the reverse for the other mycangio fungi. While Ophiopsis minus doesn't seem to be strongly affected by temperature. If we look at the mites, we see a similar type of pattern. Some mites perform well with warmer temperatures, and others perform uh, well with cooler temperatures. Temperature and the interactions among these organisms are going to influence the performance of the beetle within this tree, as there are antagonists and mutualists associates of the, mount, of the southern pine beetle. As a result of these responses to temperature, we see seasonal changes in the relative abundance of these two mycangial fungi as represented here in this figure. 
So as you move through seasons, one fungus becomes abundant, the other one declines, and vice versa as temperatures warm. This is going to have an impact on the way bark beetles perform within the tree, and also how they interact with the host, and how that host interacts with them. So if we take the figure in the upper left, uh, figure A, let's say this represents an increase with temperature. So as temperatures increase, we can see it at the black line represents a positive performance of that organism, or a red line which shows a negative performance. So there are some species that perform well as temperatures increase, and others that perform poorly. The blue in the figure, the dark blue, shows a typical range that those organisms are exposed to, while the lighter blue may show some of the extremes. And if you have a nonlinear uh, response profile, as shown in B, C, and D, you might see that during a typical environmental exposure, the organism might perform well or poorly. So if you can compare B to C, for instance, and in the extremes, you might see the reverse. So B, for instance, could be a situation where the extreme, uh, maybe it's high secondary metabolites or low moisture, uh, influence the fungus to produce spores. While in a typical range, they do not. Well, you might see the reverse and see where the typical range, maybe moderate levels of moisture, results in the best performance of that organism. And these type of profiles are going to influence the overall community that persists. So if you have, uh, in the case of B, where you need these temperature extremes for the organism to survive, you might see an increase in abundance with variation in those factors. While a more typical response like C and D, we're going to see that as extremes happen, maybe drier or higher secondary tree metabolites or higher temperatures, that we're going to see a loss in species richness. Let's take a look at temperature and climate change and what's the expected factor here. So the graph on the left shows a very typical uh, response of temperature. So you have a mean temperature there on average and a hump-shaped, bell-shaped curve. Uh, but with climate change, it's expected to warm. So the average is going to be warmer and you're going to see more extremes. Uh, in this graph, you show, it shows a, a lot of hot temperatures and record hot uh, temperature that happens. And I would also argue that we might see some uh, lower temperatures or cold temperatures as well. So the typical response of an ectosymbiont might be shown here in blue. So you have an optimal temperature that they perform at. This might be the average of uh, temperature, or it could be uh, slightly above average. And there's an operative range. This, this organism performs. Maybe it, that's its development or it reproduces during these ranges. There's also a temperature maximum, which organism uh, can't reach. If it does, it can die and a minimum temperature as well, where maybe development stops, or actually you get a, a minimum threshold where that organism dies. Let's take uh, an example of mycandro fungus, species A. We can put it on the, the curve there on the left and show, show by the blue line. So as temperature on average increases, we might see a decline in its performance. And eventually, if you hit these hot extremes, you might see a loss of that species or local extinction. We can put beetle on the graph as well. Maybe it has a slightly different temperature response relationship. In this case, it might have a slightly, uh, perform slightly poorer at hotter temperatures than the mycandro fungi. And this disconnect uh, will obviously have a, an impact on both of these species to persist over time. We can throw other organisms on here, like mycandro fungus B, shown in the orange, or even a beetle pathogen shown in the yellow. So what we see here is temperature averages increases, we might see a loss of species, and maybe a, a, a few species doing better. So in this case, an increase in temperature result in, will result in an increase in a pathogenic fungus and a loss of these mycandro fungi associated with the beetle. So what we'd expect, shown in the upper right here, is that Ectosymbiotic species abundance and richness is likely to decline as we see an increase in mean temperature 
as well as temperature extremes, which I'll talk about next. So there's, uh, if we look at the bars on the left, we see the dark blue, that's maybe the typical range of temperature variation that beetles have experienced in the past. And in the future climate situation, we might see greater extremes. And as a result of this, their growth profile is going to influence the ectosymbiotic composition. So let's take the top one as an example. This is a typical bell curve, and as, as we expect more temperature extremes, we're going to see a decline in the richness of these species over time, probably local extinctions. But if that growth profile is slightly skewed, uh, we might see actually a slight increase in, their, in the species richness with the slight increases in temperature. Eventually, though, temperature extremes are going to be so great that we're going to lose species due to uh, hitting the temperature maximum that they're allowed to grow. This interaction isn't always this simple. Uh, there are probably differences among beetle systems. Uh, some systems rely on drought stress. For instance, secondary beetles such as ips or beetles that uh, are on pinion pine uh, are going to be there's going to be a combination of drought stress and performance that are going to influence them. And I'll also argue that a lot of these organisms that are secondary or on drought stress trees may not rely on the ectosymbiotic community, and in this case may flourish in an environment uh, that is hotter and drier. This may also occur in the more southern range and lower elevations. Uh, while there are other bark beetle systems that rely on obligate mutualists, in this case we might see additional uh, losses of ectosymbiotic species at the southern or lower ranges, while actually a benefit at higher elevations. And this is shown in the graph on the left where we see uh, uh, the mountain pine beetle performing much better in higher elevation, northern latitudes, and in new hosts such as white bark pine. So, in conclusion, the the way that organisms respond to different factors is going to influence the species composition. This is complex and difficult. Oftentimes, a, a simple response to temperature is not going to be the sole factor that influences this community. While changes in host tree chemistry, nutrients, temperature, moisture, and interactions in there are all going to influence this community. So, we're going to see an increase in tree mortality because of climate change. This is drought driven, heat stress, and also some insect activity. I would argue that the ectosymbiotic community is gonna change and be dominated by those species that can persist on a more broader range of environmental conditions. I also expect beetles that are uh, dependent upon mutualists will likely suffer as a result of climate change and its lower and southern elevations where we're going to see temperature extremes influence negatively their ectosymbionts. But this might not be the case with more northern and upper elevations. I also expect that southern that secondary beetles uh, are going to probably perform better because of uh, tree stress and their lack of dependency on ectosymbiotic members. So thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Richard, for the talk. Uh, I think we can start with the discussion period. Um, I believe all our speakers are with us. Um, so the first question is for Barbara. Uh, can you comment on dispersal capacity? I was wondering, given that you observe genetic elements in observed variation, if there could be isolation and other types throughout the distribution range. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so yes, we've shown uh, in a couple of different papers that uh, it's mostly based on post-glacial isolation, that there's actually, um, yeah, there's reproductive isolation between populations on the um, east and west side of the Great Basin Desert. And our Arizona population that I showed is actually, um, so what happens is when you mate the two populations, like our Arizona population mated to one in Southern California, 
there's actually um, hybrid sterility in both directions. So <clears throat> it's most the 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 isolation is mostly um, from historical postglacial isolation. Yep. Uh, the next question is for Jeff. Do you believe that if species that are abundant in the southern populations are rare in the, in the northern ones, might also move northwards in the future? And if so, do you think that this might affect the height at which infestation by SPB is observed in the northern populations? Yeah, th thanks for that question. That's interesting. Uh, so it certainly is a hypothesis and, and not something that we know in terms of what is um, causing the greater colonization of the bull in the northern sites. Um, another comment later down mentioned bark thickness. That's certainly part of the story. To answer the question, though, I do definitely expect some of the southern species to start moving north. The northern range edge of Ipsibolsis is only slightly south of where the original range edge of uh, southern pine beetle was. So it could be arriving any day. I mean, I don't know. I have no idea what other kinds of ecological constraints are influencing the distribution of that species. But uh, I would expect communities to move as well as individual species, which was part of the motivation for this work. Thank you. And then the next question is for Richard. How do you expect these fungi to compete with each other inside the tree in these new scenarios? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a complex question. Uh, I, yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to answer. I think if we can look at specifics, uh, you know, the case with a southern pine beetle where you where the performance of some fungi do better at warmer temperatures. So a lot of their ability to uh, compete is growth rate. So if they can uh, capture resources quickly and, and another fungal species, they often can hold that resource. And so oftentimes growth rate can be directly proportional to success of a particular species with temperature responses. Uh, again, you've got moisture, you've got uh, chemical composition, nutrients, all of those are going to influence uh, performances of those fungi. And even with the mountain pine beetle that's within, with a univoltine life cycle, you've got really changes that come out throughout the year and, and fungi are going to perform differently at different times of the year. I think the real key is the ability to uh, uh, attach to exonine beetles uh, to produce produce uh, spores at the right time, uh, uh, they, they're successfully transferred to the next tree. Not sure if that answers your question. It's, it's a difficult one and uh, 15 minutes wasn't enough for me to really get into details. <laughs> I could have gotten a, a simple, yeah, it, was, it wasn't enough time. So I do appreciate to, to be able to talk, but it, it, the complexities are, are pretty great there. And, and I think we need to look at specifics to answer particular questions. Thank you. Um, so the next question is for Alan and Barbara. Have semiochemicals been incorporated in the strategies applied to slow down the Western spread of MPB into the boreal forests? Barbara, do you want me to take that one? Okay. Uh, yes. The answer is yes. So in the historic range, semiochemicals are, are commonly applied to um, things like containment and concentration uh, strategies for the mountain pine beetle, hoping to keep it in one area uh, ahead of uh, harvesting that area with the intent upon destroying the beetles. Uh, interestingly, we've uh, recently used our uh, spread modeling efforts to uh, assess whether or not there's any efficacy associated with, with that in novel range and found that it was um, um, actually not that effective in terms of slowing the spread uh, in uh, towards the boreal forest. Uh, uh, simply because the um, applications are necessarily done late enough that most of the beetles who have built up in these areas have already begun the spread process and hence removing the infestation is having no bearing on, on spread. Thank you. Uh, so I have another question for you too. Um, no, sorry, it's for Barbara, Jeff and Alan. Uh, is there any study of variation in resistance to pine beetles across the range of novel hosts, does susceptibility increase in populations farther away from current or historical host integration zones? 
Yeah, um, I can take that from the perspective of mountain pine beetle. Um, we do know that um, there are both population and species specific differences in defensive capacities. Uh, we've recently shown that both uh, uh, lodgepole pine populations are growing in areas where mountain pine beetle putatively has not been before, do not defend themselves to the same degree as do populations in the native range. And we also know that to be true of jack pine. And more recently, some evidence coming out of colleagues of mine working at the University of Alberta have shown that indeed, um, by looking at uh, populations of lodgepole pine um, that survived mountain pine beetle versus those that died, that there's actually been selection on the part of mountain pine beetle for the loss of uh, some of the uh, rare um, the rarer alleles effectively, uh, meaning that there's been uh, significant selection, potentially selection for um, um, specific defensive capacities. Thank you. Just, go ahead. I, I, can, I can add for, for pitch pine. I, I don't think there's been much work uh, on, on pitch pine genetic susceptibility. I would imagine there would be variation in early resin production, either quantity or, or quality of the chemistry in, in, therein, but uh, it, it's actually not a novel host per se, although the populations are novel. So, but yeah, I, I would expect that there might be, but we don't, I don't think we know the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a, a question for Jeff next. Uh, SPB colonizing bigger part of hole in uh, north, is that due to bark thickness? Because sizes of trees decline northward and thereby include a bigger surface of suitable bark thickness along the pole? that various bark beetle species of certain preferred ranges of bark thickness is well known. That, that's definitely true. And in fact, we did find that bark thickness was uh, greater in the pitch pine we, that we studied in the northern sites relative to the um, shortleaf and um, loblolly in the south. So it could be, well, it's actually fairly likely that Southern pine beetle was able to colonize the, the bark higher up just because it, the bark was thicker. And that could potentially also affect Ipsivulsus if it ever gets there. But uh, that, that's a good alternative hypothesis and surely part of the story. Thank you. I have the next question is for Richard. You hypothesize that climate change will lead to a decrease in ectosymbiotic diversity is very interesting. Have you checked if you can see this pattern in species comparisons when you compare beetles in more stable versus variable habitats in, term, in terms of temperature? Yeah, uh, it's from Peter. That's a, that's a really good question. And it, I would argue that I, I haven't studied that specifically. It's more of a hypothesis idea. And, and I tried to influence the, the, the range of extremes are really what's gonna be detrimental to a lot of these species. I think there's been selection for multiple uh, obligate mutualists to help with variation in the environment. This can include temperature as well as secondary metabolites. Uh, and we see a seasonal change too, even with the Southern Pine Beetle example. Uh, so I, I, I think that would be really interesting to look at. And that's why I kind of like to think about ambrosia beetles that have a much more stable environment. Uh, it'd be interesting to know, to study that system a little more detail and how these uh, temperature variation would affect their their persistence within this community. So uh, yeah, good question. And I'd love to love to pursue that more. Thank you. Uh, next, I have a question for Barbara. If in MPB or SPB, there is a reduction in the duration of the biological cycle with the possibility of developing a new generation in the year, what could ha happen with other univoltine species such as Tomicus in this truance in the Mediterranean region? So I think the question was asking if there could be a reduction in generation time. Is, is that what the question was? Yes. Um, well, I guess what we think is unless winter temperatures um, really, really warm, there won't be a reduction in generation time um, unless you know they move into areas that are really, really warm. So Ips Typographus already has multiple generations per year. Um, uh, maybe I didn't hear the question fully. Can you <laughs> ask me again? Yes, maybe? I will repeat that. Um, 
uh, so in MPB or SPB, is there a reduction in the duration of the biological cycle with the possibility of developing a new generation in the year? What could happen with other univoltine species such as Stomicus destruans in the Mediterranean region? Um, yeah, it all depends on their complex physiology. So southern pine beetle in, in the warmer parts of its range has multiple generations per year. But to my knowledge, and perhaps Jeff can comment on this, in the northern part of the range, it is univoltine. So it's all dependent on the physiology of the insects and like um, the Ips distress. I don't know what its complex phys physiology is. So it could be different depending on the location, geographic location where it is and the temperature. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Jeff next. Despite northern shift in range due to warm weather, do you think extreme events will determine a very different pattern? Uh, so, well, I mean, that's good. It's a complicated question. Uh, the, it, it's really winter freeze cold that affects Southern pine beetle in the North because they overwinter in the bowl and they're not, and they're not freeze tolerant. So if the temperature gets below about negative 14, give or take, uh, C, uh, many of the beetles will die. And, um, and so that sort of limits the Northern range edge, uh, extreme events in terms of like storms and, uh, Disturbance, I guess it's hard to say. Southern pine beetle doesn't require disturbance vents to attack trees when it's in an outbreak um, situation or condition. Uh, other species, like many of the ips, certainly do. So, yeah, for sure, disturbance of wind, wind throw, things like that can affect uh, especially ips. And then we don't understand quite yet what the feedbacks are between ips and southern pine beetle, but that's an interesting question. Thank you. Uh, then the uh, question for Richard, would you expect that in more variable tree hosts in terms of defensive uh, chemicals would also select for less diverse ectosymbiont communities? Uh, yeah, another another really good question. And again, this is, is an interesting one. You know, during, uh, after an attack, you see a, a change in that chemistry, you know, a loss of monoterpenes over time uh, where that's going to influence the relative performance of these these microbes even during the the life cycle of the beetle within the host tree. Uh, one one thing I've noticed in Arizona is we have a very uh, highly diverse forest stand. So Ponderosa is extremely chemically diverse, and in that case, you've got different trees with different uh, sort of uh, secondary uh, metabolites and, and secondary. Uh, compounds that are going to influence the success of beetles. And we see this. We see beetle communities attacking different uh, chemotypes and performing really poorly in some of them. And, and so this is a difficult question. I think if that uh, symbiotic community, community is diverse, it's going to allow greater ability of beetles to colonize multiple host types. But if it's not diverse, then you're going to see some losses of uh, it may be a uh, loss of performance of bark beetles when they go into new novel hosts or, or uh, trees that they haven't experienced much uh, history with. And this could be the case with the jack vine, you know, moving into the jack vine and uh, those symbiotic communities aren't, uh, sort of aren't adapted to that community as well. Uh, so yeah, a good question. And uh, again, there's a lot of complexities involved there. And, you know, some of these symbionts may be more generalist, ability to survive a range of, of compounds, where others might specialize in, in, in certain conditions. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Barbara. What might be the, ad the adaptive advantage for slower development in Arizona, or is it easier to think of adaptive advantage of faster development in Utah? Oh, good question. Um... What we've always thought was because it's uh, a bit warmer environment in the in Arizona than it is in Utah, for example. The it's been shown repeatedly that a univoltine life cycle is the most advantageous for this species, and so there's a slowdown in what we think now is the tenal adult life stage in the southern populations, so that they can maintain that univoltine life cycle and not come out at the wrong time. 
So basically to maintain a univolting life cycle in a warmer area. Thank you. Uh, then we have a question for Jeff. Did you observe any difference in the species composition between felt and standing trees? Uh, so the felled trees that we sampled uh, were had been on the ground for all of you know a day or, or two in, in the vast majority of cases, as, as I understand it. I see Caroline's here. She can chime in if she'd like to, the PhD student who did this work. Um, so really, if there were, were any differences, it would be an artifact of, of the fact that we only were able to sample from the lowest part of the bowl in the standing trees, whereas we sampled the whole of the bowl in the felled trees. But I wouldn't expect uh, divergence in communities based on the fact that they were on the ground since they had been felt so recently. Um, I also don't think we had enough standing trees in our sample to make a valid comparison. Yeah, we usually sampled same day um, as they were felling. So, Thank you. Uh, then a question for Richard. Is there any study to show how the inability of the fungus to produce reproductive state under given climate extremes translate to collapse of vector slash beetle population, for example, where there isn't an alternative symbiont to switch to? Yeah, uh, this, that, that's a good question. And whether there's a specific example, I, I think this occurs, this occurs not often, but it, it, it does occur. And uh, for instance, we see in the Southern pine beetle uh, situations where, where temperature extremes can really influence the the plethora of this antagonistic fungus, Alpheopsis minus, and uh, we see a, a drastic decline in populations when that fungus uh, proliferates. Uh, and I also think that even in these mycandra fungi, if there's a disconnect with temperature when beetles are emerging, that would influence spore production, that you would see a loss or decline in that particular species of fungi. Uh, and so I, I do think this, uh, this does occur, and, and it also causes the variation uh, throughout populations uh, at a local scale. So yeah, I do, I do think this does occur. And, you know, there's examples with Southern pine beetle, mountain pine beetle, uh, where you see a loss or increase in one of the obligate fungal species. And I think that really is driven by, by uh, temperatures. Thank you. Uh, so there is another, another question for you, Richard. Do you think nematode parasitism suppresses beetles in a climate-dependent way? Yeah, you know, nematodes are not my specialty, but I would imagine that they there are some species that would perform uh, differentially with temperature, and as temperatures increase, they would probably proliferate and could cause some, some pretty significant impacts. Uh, I think in moist, hot habitats, you, you would see probably an increase in, in nematodes as they're dependent upon moisture levels within the host. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say yes. <laughs> Again, that's not my expertise, but I would imagine that would be the case. Uh, it, I would think the nematode would proliferate during summer uh, wet times uh, versus winter where they would be pretty limited in their movements. Thank you. Uh, then the next question is for Jeff. Um, for the last decade or so, increases of native pathogens in white pine have been seen. For example, for example, Caliciopsis canker. This is assumed to be stress-related. Has any increase in SPB attacking white pine been seen anywhere? So I'm, I'm looking out my window right now at white pine saplings that were killed by Caliciopsis, and so that certainly is an issue. We had a drought last last summer. Uh, white pine needle damage is another uh, big issue for us here. Um, white pine is in a different subgenus of pine, and it, it tends to be much less susceptible, for whatever reason, uh, to southern pine beetle attack. Uh, it does get attacked as sort of a spillover host sometimes. In fact, in Long Island, we did see that. Um, we intended to study uh, beetle development uh, in white pine for this project, as a matter of fact, but the populations were so small in white pine and uh, really suffering, and we weren't even able to get enough replicates to do the to do the study properly. So, my guess is that for the time being, white pine is relatively unsusceptible, but it, it does on occasion get hit, hit and killed. Out. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. I believe you have a question for Alan. Sure. So, 
Alan, you mentioned that uh, the monocamus and, and they respond to their faculty of integral predators. They, they're attracted to bark beetle pheromones. Um, I'm curious what you think's going on and, and why you didn't see them in the, the co-evolved zone. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating question, uh, Jeremy, and and uh, and to be honest, uh, in all of the surveys done uh, across the areas in the um, in the native range, um, there are lots of wood borers without question. Um, they just don't seem to co-occur with bark beetles. There's a, a sequence of events where the bark beetles are there first, and what follows after that would be uh, ambrosia beetles, and then the uh, the larger wood borers. Um, the co-occurrence of bark beetles and wood borers in uh, jack pine and to a lesser degree in, in the naive lodgepole was quite a surprise to us and seems to be in part as associated with the fact that there's so much, so, so, um, uh, so, so many fewer uh, susceptible trees to uh, bark beetles in these jack pine areas as a consequence of the syllabix that uh, the few that are there become very uh, significant focal points for both bark beetles and wood borers together. And so Ips pinei together with Tetropium and Monocamus tend to pile in all at the same time. Um, other than that, I'm really not sure what's going on. I did see, or we did see, uh, sorry, lots of damaged trees. Wind breakage is a big thing east of the Rockies, much more so to the west. Uh, I didn't show those data. Uh, but therein you also find uh, wind breakish large trees, um, also a serious focal point for both bark beetles and wood borers together concurrently. I, I'm, I have a, a comment. Uh, we, we oftentimes see wood borers uh, coincident with mountain pine beetle in ponderosa pine, but not necessarily in lodgepole. And we've often wondered if it's because of the thick bark, maybe. But yeah, we do see them coincident in ponderous pine. Yeah, it, it was a, an interesting thing because I mean, we, we almost had so many zeros as to preclude any statistical analyses where really you just don't find them in, in our uh, lodgepole forests to the west of the Rockies, but they're quite common to the east. Yeah. And doesn't, oh, so it's not just jack pine because jack pine has thicker bark too, right? Could yeah. be wrong. Yeah. I'm just wondering if bark thickness may have a play a role. Doesn't seem to slow down the Ipspinae. <laughs> huh. um, so we have still a bit more time. Uh, Alan, you answered some questions in the chat box er earlier, uh, but I'm thinking some people might not be looking at the chat box. So if you don't mind, I'll ask you the questions and maybe you can answer for everyone. Um, have these local retreats or extinctions of MPB in jack pine habitats actually been observed, or is this only a model result? Yes, yes. So Stan Picorni has uh, observed uh, this um, outcome, where we see invasion of the habitats by uh, you know immigrants that have led to uh, ultimate extinction with uh, largely a, a com combination of both. Uh, uh, an unavailability of, of endemic susceptible trees and, uh, and an incomplete adjustment on the part of the beetles to becoming endemic in these habitats. They do seem to display the ability to be endemic in jack pine, but uh, not necessarily quite so completely uh, there as they do in lodgepole. And ultimately, because of the lack of trees available to the endemic beetles, um, there's lots of localized extinctions along the invasion front. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. The next question. What are the reasons for the structural differences between lodgepole and jack pine forests? Some other important disturbance regimes. Yeah, uh, the, the difference is uh, in the Western boreal, I'll, I'll make sure that I confine my comments to that because I know things do change going east. But in the Western boreal, there is a tendency for lodgepole, for example, um, to um, regenerate very densely and, uh, and go through a process of self thinning that can last well over 100 years. Um, so there's a steady supply of endemic susceptible trees being introduced into the population as a consequence of competition, intertree competition. Jack pine, by contrast, uh, regenerates at a much lower density and that self thinning process ceases by about age 50 or so. So there's a very short window of time during which we have uh, uh, these suppressed trees available for beetles. So it's just a, a species specific sylvic uh, difference. Thank you. Uh, then are there differences in the main mortality factors of MPB between original 
in, na in naive habitats, like differential losses in winter mortality rates or due to antagonists? So far as we know, um, you know the, uh, the, the main sources of mortality um, are similar on uh, either side of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, cold is, is a big thing uh, and can cause significant amounts of mortality and, and cold events happen on, on both sides of the Rockies and have been responsible for the collapse of populations in the past. Um, everything else originally was thought to be similar uh, until um, we began noticing this differential sorts of exposure to wood borers. So that would be the difference. Um, as far as mutualists are concerned, uh, again, we haven't studied this in detail, but studies that I'm aware of have shown that largely they remain consistent on both sides of the rock. So there is, uh, uh, there is that as well. Okay, we have a follow-up question. Do you think the eastward spread of MPB is actually fizzling out given the apparent shortage of susceptible trees in the Jack Pine Range? Um, yeah, my prediction overall is that the, the eastern spread it will be put on hold as a consequence of uh, uh, the collapse of the epidemic uh, push. Uh, and this is largely a result of just the um, uh, lack of source populations to the west. Uh, we do, and we did find an, uh, uh, this issue whereby um, the um, the introgression of lodgepole and jack actually is a very complicated outcome, and it actually leads to uh, backcrossing to the extent that, that uh, hybrids are usually, usually mostly jack and mostly lodgepole. But the outcome of that means that lodgepole-type habitats actually uh, intermingle amongst the jack pine and go almost entirely across uh, the province of Alberta towards uh, well, well into the boreal forest. And our interpretation of that is that this means that there's likely to be a reservoir of endemic mountain pine beetles persisting well into that western portion of the boreal and capable of erupting and spreading back as epidemic populations into jack pine, where they do seem to be uh, capable of making uh, a fine living. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions coming for you. Does the history of management or no management in the lodgepole pine system and jack pine system result in the differences observed? Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So there's there's a long-term management legacy in, in the entire system, both east and west of the Rockies, that's associated with, uh, for the most part, fire suppression. So uh, fire suppression has actually allowed forests to age unnaturally. And this is something that we looked at some years ago and found that in British Columbia, in the native range that uh, we had through fire suppression produced about three times as much mature pine available for the outbreak, the hyper epidemic that we had. Uh, that same outcome uh, can be seen in Alberta, both in the lodgepole and jack in the working forest where they have removed fire once again, allowing the, uh, the, the forest to get uh, unnaturally old over larger areas. So there is a, certainly a legacy of, of, of management uh, causing the problem for sure. Thank you. Uh, so thanks to all the speakers. Uh, I think, Jeremy, would you like to close up the meeting? Can I, can I yeah. make one oh, comment? Yes, of course. <laughs> I wanted to um, just comment. I didn't have time to talk about it in uh, my 10 minutes, but the, the study that I showed it actually has a connection to what Alan was talking about, um, how the endemic niche of mountain pine beetle going in eastern into Canada may be messed up and may influence the range expansion. And we actually think the same thing may be going on um, going south. So the site that I talked about that was just outside of the mountain pine beetle range that was so much lower or so much warmer, we have traditionally thought that maybe they weren't moving further south because it was too warm. But we showed that they can reproduce there. So we think it um, it's being, what's the word? There's other factors that are playing that are biotic as opposed to abiotic. And so it could be similar to the range expansion in Canada, could be playing a similar role going south in the United States and into Mexico. So I just wanted to make that connection between what Alan and I were both talking about. Thank you. So um, a great series of talks today. Thank you to, to all the speakers. Um, a testament to the quality that we had uh, 100 people st stay straight to the bitter end. Um, 
thanks to the audience for joining in. And for those of you who have time, in two weeks' time, March 18, Eki Brockerhoff has uh, coordinated the next webinar, and it'll be on behavioral and invasion ecology of Hylurgus lignoperda. So thank you all. <laughs>